Okay, I think uh, there's a good number of participants right now, so we can start. <coughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Jorge Campos. I'm a PhD candidate in Joel Joan Su's research group at UC San Diego, and I welcome you to this edition of the Polariton Chemistry webinars. Before we start with our talk, I would like to make a few announcements and introduce the mechanics of this webinar series. First, the Journal of Chemical Physics will have a special issue of polariton chemistry, molecules in cavities, uh, and plasmonic media. Uh, the editors will be professors Lasse Jensen, Timur Shagai, Wei Xiong, and Huen Joel Su. You are all welcome to contribute. The submission deadline will be October 16th this year. Let's talk about our schedule. So our webinar is held every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. You can register for each talk through this link or the one that we provide in the reminder email we send every week. Right now, we're restructuring our schedule of talks, so please expect announcements about our new lineup of speakers anytime this week. I would like to mention our Polariton Chemistry Online Community webpage on Facebook, which allows everyone to share papers and post announcements. So actually, I've been seeing that there's a lot of, of work, there's amazing results getting, results getting out there. So please uh, don't hesitate to use this forum to share, uh, to spread the word with all the community. You can find it by the name here displayed on the screen. Additionally, we have uploaded our recorded videos from this Polariton Chemistry webinar to a YouTube channel. For those who missed the talk, you can subscribe and watch these videos later. I would like to encourage you to be a positive influence online and use the comment section to further the discussions about the topics on the webinars. Finally, I'll introduce the mechanics of the webinar. During the talk, attendees are all muted. For those who have questions, you can click the raise hand button. I will let the speaker know at an appropriate time and enable your audio so you can ask your question. Also, you can type your comments or ideas using the chat function. Uh, so that you can share with everyone. And additionally, you can type your questions in the Q&A panel where they will be addressed at the end of the talk. In case there are questions left unanswered due to the webinar time limit, we will collect them and send them to the speaker after the talk. Before we move on to today's webinar, I'd like to thank all the 84 attendees right now. I think it's a, it's a pretty good number. Um, yeah, we really appreciate your continued support. So, for today's talk, we are honored to have Johannes Feist from the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. He did his PhD at the Institute for Theoretical Physics of the Vienna University of Technology as a member of the International Max Planck Research School on Advanced Photon Science under the supervision of Joachim Burgdorfer. He was a postdoc at the Institute for Theoretical, Atomic, Molecular, and Optical Physics at Harvard and at the Nanophotonic Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. He is currently a Ramón y Cajal Fellow at the Departamento de Física Teórica de la Materia Condensada and at the Condensed Matter Physics Center at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. He has over 80 publications and has won several awards, such as the Young Scientist Prize from the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. His current work focuses on modification of molecular structure under a strong coupling to confined light modes, which is why we have him today to talk us about how to quantize lossy plasmonic and hybrid cavities and how to use them for ultrafast polaritonic chemistry. Please give Dr. Feist a warm welcome to your computers from wherever you're listening to us. And with that, let me store, stop sharing my screen. And Johannes, the mic and the screen are all yours. Okay, so thanks a lot for the introduction and uh, thanks again for the organizers for inviting me for this. I'm really happy that we are managing to meet as a community, at least virtually still, uh, in these uh, difficult times. And uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is, uh, as uh, we just heard about, uh, basically kind of how to quantize lossy plasmonic hybrid and uh, cavities and then how to use them for ultrafast polaritonic chemistry. So before uh, it gets uh, 
uh, time gets short at the end and I don't have time to uh, acknowledge all of the people who contributed. I'm going to show first the slide of all the people who uh, contributed to the work that I'm showing here and also to acknowledge uh, the funding from ERC and from the Spanish Ministry of Science and Innovation. And also to mention that if you have any further uh, uh, questions and so on, you can also find our latest publications, etc., on the webpage, muscles.eu. And if any people are interested in, in working with us, we always have uh, kind of student and postdoc positions available. So to start with, I'm going to give a very short introduction since this is the 20th talk in the series. I'm guessing most people are going to know a lot about polaritonic chemistry already, but in general, if we want to talk about cavity modified material properties, the idea is that we want to use light to modify material properties and maybe even the vacuum fields, let's say, without any external driving. So in order to do this, what we need to do is to confine light in space to get strong single photon interaction with interesting materials. So to, in order to confine light in space, we need to use kind of the tools of nanophotonics, plasmonics, uh, and so on. In order to, since we want to treat kind of single photon, a few photon effects, we need to think about quantizing the light field. We have to do cavity quantum electrodynamics or quantum optics. And since we want to do interesting materials, we want to affect material properties. Uh, we have to look a bit into kind of uh, material science or chemistry or something like that where we don't just treat uh, two-level systems, let's say. Okay, so a very short introduction about polaritons and strong light matter coupling. If we have a, here a conceptual system where I have a two-level system inside the cavity, what the cavity does is that it changes the electromagnetic environment or the density of states that I have available. And in a very simple model, and based on the first excitation subspace of the James Cummings model, I can write the Hamiltonian describing uh, the interaction between an excitation on my emitter and a photon in my cavity that I have here on the diagonal uh, through the coupling G that is given by the dipole field interaction mu dot E in the cavity where the single photon field strength is proportional to the uh, inverse square root of the effective mode volume. So basically how tightly have I squeezed my photon, how small is the space that my photon is in. And the simple Hamiltonian that I can treat here is this two by two Hamiltonian with the only kind of non-standard part being that I have losses, that I have imaginary parts that I've included here, where I included the gamma that represents emitter losses, so that the emitter decays in time if I excite it, and the cavity has cavity losses parameterized by this parameter kappa. So this two by two Hamiltonian is trivial to diagonalize, and the eigenstate energies that I get are since I assumed here that they are on resonance, are just the uh, omega zero minus the average losses. And then I get this most interesting term that is plus minus the square root that contains the coupling squared minus a term containing the losses squared. So if I think here, it's the cavity, here's, here's the cavity excitation and frequency omega zero, here's the emitter at omega zero. If I'm in the weak coupling regime, if this G squared is smaller than this loss term, the square root is uh, purely imaginary. And what I'm doing really is just changing the imaginary parts of my energy. So I'm changing basically the radiative decay of my emitter. Uh, this is the so-called weak coupling regime. And what I get then is the so-called Tarsell effect that the cavity can enhance or also suppress the emission rate of the emitter. But if I reach the strong coupling regime, where the coupling squared is larger than these losses. So in general, where the coupling is larger than the losses. Instead of getting spontaneous emission that is just exponential decay, if I start with an excited emitter, I get the so-called vacuum Rabi oscillations where I see coherent energy exchange from the emitter to the cavity and back. So if I look at the emitter population as a function of time, I see these Rabi oscillations. And if I think of this in terms of an eigenstate picture, the eigenstates, in this system then become hybrid light matter states, exactly the so-called polaritons or rest states. And here in this energy ladder, we can see that I get this uh, so-called upper polariton and lower polariton that are exactly superpositions of either an excitation on the emitter and no photon 
or the emitter in its ground state and the single photon in the cavity. And this was it basically already for the introduction and kind of the menu for today that the things I want to talk about is, as um, I said in the title already, first uh, kind of a part about more the electromagnetic part of, the, of this problem. So if I have actually realistic plasmonic or hybrid metallodielectric cavities, how can I quantize the, the field modes in there? And I'm going to start with discussing uh, actually a well-known framework that has not been used too much in nanophotonics, which is macroscopic QED. So we just recently wrote kind of an overview article of this. This is actually not new results, but I think it's very good to, to kind of go over this because there's some conceptual points that are good to discuss. And then I'm gonna uh, talk about some recent work we did, we did on doing few mode field quantization. So, and then the second part of the talk will be focused on actually kind of using these uh, systems for ultrafast polyaritonic chemistry. And I'm gonna go into the details on that later on when we get to that part. So let's start with this first part. How do we, can we quantize the electromagnetic field in this kind of systems? So as we said, we want a quantum description of light matter interactions in nanophotonic structures. But kind of an important question to answer here is what do we, do we really mean when we say light and matter in this case? So the simple picture, uh, or the, the traditional picture, which is non-relativistic quantum electrodynamics, simply deals with point-like charges which are electrons and nuclei, since we're talking about non-relativistic, we cannot uh, create or destroy these charges, they're just there. And the second ingredient are free space photons, which only contain transverse electromagnetic fields. Uh, so and typically or traditionally, if I were to do cavity QED in a big cavity with a few atoms in there at very low temperatures, it's basically enough to add boundary conditions for the electromagnetic fields, which discretizes the modes. I have a few discrete modes. And then I have losses that are in a very good approximation, just a small perturbation on top, so I have to treat them. But it's not a huge problem to do so. But what we are talking about is actually modifying materials. So we really need uh, strong interactions and in fact, in in particular, I want to talk about single emitter and strong single emitter interactions. And to get that, you really need strong sub-wavelength confinement. So you cannot use a cavity like this. You cannot use a cavity where you have mirrors and the size of the cavity is on the order of a wavelength. What you need to use is uh, kind of plasmonic nano cavities, for example, like uh, famously uh, used by Jeremy Baumberg to reach single molecule strong coupling, which are really a very different kind of beast. So if we think in terms of length scales, these are typically kind of small nano antennas on the order of a few of 100 nanometers or so, or 20 nanometer, that then have a very small nano gap in which I actually confine the electromagnetic fields. And when I say confine the electromagnetic fields, the fields, they are not just pure propagating transverse fields. They actually, the excitations of this system are uh, both charge uh, and, uh, and electromagnetic excitations are charge oscillations, plasmons, and electromagnetic os uh, excitations and electromagnetic fields. So in this kind, kind of regime of sub-wavelength cavity QED, the material structure is really an important part that is part of the light mode. And what I call photons colloquially are really mixed light matter excitations. As we know in principle, I mean, we know that these excitations are called surface plasma and polaritons, they're not photons. But it also, for example, implies that my electromagnetic fields have longitudinal components that they do not have if they're propagating electromagnetic fields. And a lot of the energy of these so-called light modes is actually stored in material excitations. And an important uh, consequence of this, especially for these plasmonic uh, structures that are made out of metal, is that you always have extremely fast losses, very short lifetimes, because uh, metal is just a very lossy uh, system. And in addition, they're not really strongly confined uh, modes that I have. I always have relatively strong radiation losses, or at least for many of the modes that I'm interested in. So I really have to be very careful on how to treat the material and radiation losses if I want to quantize this. And the lifetimes I usually get on the order of femtoseconds. 
So how do I now uh, quantize the electromagnetic field, or actually the mixed light uh, matter field of this cavity? And the approach that I think is the most uh, useful approach for doing this is so-called macroscopic QED. And the basic idea is that we separate all of the material that we have in the system into two parts. One, the emitters that are really collections of charged particles, like in traditional QED. And this I can describe through quantum chemistry or similar approaches. And then what I call the cavity, which is really just an arbitrary material structure that I assume has linear response. So that uh, I can describe through the equations of macroscopic electromagnetism. So for example, these plasmonic nanoparticles. And if I assume a, a local response, this means I describe it basically through a position and frequency dependent uh, permittivity and permeability function. And many times permeability is assumed to be one. So I just uh, treat the electric permittivity. And then the idea of macroscopic QED, this has been developed over decades by, by, by I cite here a few pa uh, papers. The last two are very nice uh, videos and the book, actually it's the second part of this book as well, that show all of the, all of the details of the method and a lot of uh, very interesting applications. So this is not something we developed at all, but just, and I don't want to go into any of the details, but just to say very quickly, the idea of microscopic QED is then to basically diagonalize both the material excitations of what I call the cavity and the free electromagnetic field together to obtain quantized medium assisted electromagnetic field modes, which are actually solutions of the microscopic Maxwell equations. Conceptually, if you're wondering how you can do this, uh, one way to derive it is to basically represent material excitations as model harmonic oscillators coupled to a bath of harmonic oscillators that allow you to treat losses so that you have lossy materials. And then since free electromagnetic fields are also harmonic oscillators, it ends up just being a system of coupled harmonic oscillators that you can formally diagonalize. And uh, we're not gonna go through this, but the final result that you get is that you can write the full Hamiltonian as a, a Hamiltonian for the emitters, a Hamiltonian for the field and the emitter field interaction. And this is all formally kind of uh, very well derived and, and really gives you a unambiguous way of quantizing the field. The price that you pay is that well, your emitters are nice. Your emitters are just the normal kinetic energies and Coulomb interactions between the charges. But the field modes formally are now bosonic, uh, are created by bosonic operators that exist everywhere in space. So you have a 3D continuum in space where these field operators exist and at all frequencies. And in addition, you have electric and magnetic excitations. So you have another factor too. So this is a huge, uh, system formally, but at least it's a uh, canonical way of quantizing the fields. And the, elect the emitter field interaction, very interestingly, uh, is given by this simple form. This is, I wanna make sure to point out, this is minimal coupling. So this is the, term, the, the form where in free space, you would only have a P dot A interaction. And I'm gonna first write this in the dipole approximation. So when I write this in the dipole approximation, it, uh, you see that you actually get three terms now. You get the term that is D dot E, and this is a longitudinal electric field that shows up in the Coulomb gauge. So even in Coulomb gauge, when normally in traditional QED it wouldn't show up because you, exactly you have a material body and you have uh, charge oscillations in the material body and these produce electromagnetic fields that are longitudinal, that are basically electro electrostatic fields. And it turns out if I have sub-wavelength cavities, these are actually the dominant electromagnetic fields. So if I do the quasi-static approximation, which we know to work extremely well for describing uh, plasmonic nanocavities, etc. I think Jeremy Baumberg also mentioned this in his talk. Uh, basically, this is the only term that survives. And this term is actually gauge independent because this is already the longitudinal part of the electromagnetic field that is gauge independent. And 
since I here wrote the fields kind of as, a, as the field expression, in reality, the fields are again expressed through these uh, bosonic uh, uh, operators F that exist everywhere in space and actually get the field at a specific point in time. The, the field mode in some sense is exactly given by the classical electromagnetic winds function of the system. And here, exactly for the longitudinal field, I only get the longitudinal part of the Green's function and for the transverse, uh, for the vector potential, which is purely transverse in the, in the Coulomb gauge that we're using here, I get the transverse part of the Green's function. And just to mention for completeness, because this is going to be the form that we use in the, in the next steps, I can here do the, uh, do the gauge transformation from the a minimal coupling Hamiltonian to the so-called multipolar form or Poincaré form or dipole gauge, uh, which basically goes through the power Zina Woolley transformation. And what I kind of pay by doing this is that I get an additional term in the emitter Hamiltonian that is an integral over the transverse polarization of the, uh, of the emitter. That is a so-called polarization self-interaction, but this actually turns out to be cavity independent. So this is kind of a, a perturbation on the emitter Hamiltonian that is actually very tricky to treat correctly, but it's the same in free space as in the cavity. So you can in some sense say, okay, if in free space, this is not a problem in the cavity, it shouldn't be either. And the nice thing is that now the emitter field interaction is given simply by the dipole uh, electric field interaction. Again, this is in long wavelength approximation and I've neglected some magnetic interactions. So I'm assuming that the magnetic fields are weak. And now the electric field that shows up here is simply given by the Green's function without any projection on longitudinal or transverse parts. So the final result that we get is that we have a medium assisted electromagnetic field represented by bosonic operators. Everything is nicely quantized. And in principle, I could use this. But as we said, the problem is that this is a 4D continuum of electromagnetic modes because I have a mode at every position in space and at every frequency. So when I want to use it, what I usually do is either perturbation theory where actually this uh, drops out or uh, Laplace transform dynamics or something like that where I can remove the explicit uh, modes, but I cannot use them directly in any kind of kind of uh, quantum optic sense where I want to use a few quantized modes. I have a huge uh, amount. So how can we reduce the number of modes? It turns out that one thing you can already do without doing any approximations is, uh, well, if we assume that we have only a single emitter and we assume that we have only one relevant transition, dipole transition orientation, is that we can do actually an orthogonal transformation of these modes at each frequency in such a way that I end up with having only a single mode at each frequency that couples to my emitter. So I have transformed a 4D continuum into a 1D continuum. So these modes B now are still kind of a nice uh, quantum uh, harmonic oscillator operators with the standard relation, uh, uh, commutation relations. And this, uh, the coefficients that I need to do that to, uh, to form them from the from this uh, original bosonic operators are again given by the Green's function with some normalization factor that turns out to be related exactly to the spectral density of my electromagnetic field at the position of the emitter. So that to the imaginary part of the Green's function from the emitter position to the emitter position. And the Hamiltonian after this transformation actually becomes very simple. I have again the same emitter Hamiltonian as before, but now I have only a single continuum of electromagnetic modes, exactly given by these modes B. So I have H bar omega B dagger B dagger, and a coupling of each of these modes with the emitter given by exactly this normalization factor, which is given or related to the spectral density uh, G of omega. And then I have a huge number of electromagnetic modes that are actually not coupled to the emitter. So I can just ignore them as, uh, because they don't participate in the dynamics of the light matter interaction. We have one question. Sure. 
Hi, uh, Johannes. Sorry, ju ju just so that uh, I understand what you are doing. So these these uh, B of Omega emitter center modes, I can think of them as quote unquote like these bright modes that are the ones that couple to the emitter, right? But then the only reason, but then these uh, the the electromagnetic modes they don't talk to each other because there are by definition normal modes, right? But now my yeah. my, my, my my question I, I want to ask is uh, when, when I listen to talks on plasmonics, they always talk about say time of defacing of the plasmon to form hot electrons and so on. So I would think about, I, I would think that that would not be captured by, um, by this normal mood picture. Would that be correct to state that? No, this is here, this is all there. I mean, this is completely, I mean, let's say everything that is described through the dielectric function is there. Sure. And the important uh, point here is that, uh, and this is a continuum, so this can represent uh, DK, etc., still without problems. These are not discrete modes. Wait, hold on. But then, if I say I want to, uh, I, I want to describe the defacing of the of the plasmonic excitation into just hot electrons that are uh, just electron hole pair excitations, which I don't sure. think one can treat as uh, bosonic modes then this formalism does not allow me to do that. Would, that, would you agree with that? Or, or is that not a correct statement? I think you would, I mean, you would have to add the electron hole pairs, but I'm guessing that you could probably do a very good approximation, write them as being driven by these modes. But I have not seen. But, I mean, then, I but not, then wouldn't that be basically break down the assumption of the normal modes? Sorry, wouldn't that break down the assumption of uh, the plasma modes being actual normal modes of the electromagnetic field that you are? Uh, yeah. Thinking? So that's what I'm saying. I think in principle everything is in there as long as it's described through the dielectric function of the plasma. I think also that. Uh, the hot plasmon decay and so on is, if you look into the microscopic details, is one of the decay channels of the loss in the metal, but it's not, but it's described within the dielectric function. It is? So, I, I think so. I'm not 100% sure, honestly, because I've never, never looked into hot plasmon. Okay, I, I'm just very quickly, okay, so I have seen that the other way to treat these systems uh, is to use hydrodynamic models uh, for the, no, this stupid. the hydrodynamic model will just give you a different Green's function. So uh -huh. here, I, for simplicity, I talked about using a dielectric function that is normal, but if you use the hydrodynamic model, that's just using a non-local dielectric function, and the Green's function changes. Okay, and but non-local non dielectric is fine in your formalism. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah. So. Yeah, one thing I wanted to mention, in fact, again, these are not things that we invented. Uh, we uh, have a second actually... question. Okay, sure. Oh, sorry, I think we... Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Great. Uh, you have these quantities G lambda, which enter this coupling uh, beta lambda. And, uh, and then you have in the definition of the G of omega, another thing called the G. Yeah. What, uh, which, uh, you know, you sort of, uh, what is this G now without the lambda? Yeah, so this is actually the standard uh, electromagnetic Prince function. I skipped over this because it's kind of a, a detail in the derivation. So this here is the standard electromagnetic Green's function. And these G lambdas that you refer to, that show up here, are actually uh, the kind of uh, functions that contain the dielectric Green's function, but contain a prefactor that depends on the dielectric uh, constant of the material. Actually, the imaginary part of the dielectric constant of the material. But one of the nice things exactly in this uh, emitter centered modes is that this drops out. So you just end up with the normal dielectric Green's function and uh, with the normal electromagnetic Green's function. Okay, okay, thank you. 
Sure. Okay, so as I was saying, this was actually invented by several groups kind of independently. So first by uh, Stefan Bumann in 2008, and then by uh, actually Francisco Garcia Vidal and co-workers in 2013, and by Rousseau and uh, co-workers in 2016. I think this is actually these are from the same group. And since, I mean, the fact that this has been kind of invented in the literature two or three, uh, three or four times independently uh, tells you that it's a very useful approach. And that's why we uh, really wanted to kind of make it more known because I think it's really a very strong, a very simple final result of how you can, can get really consistently and correctly quantized electromagnetic fields in any kind of material structure. So we call it cavity, but it really can be anything as long as you can calculate the Green's function. And something that I'm not discussing in detail in this talk, but in, the, in this archive paper that we wrote, uh, we have all the details. Uh, if you have more than one emitter, the same approach actually works. You get a single, you get one electromagnetic continuum per emitter, but they are not a priori orthogonal. So then you have to orthogonalize them. This makes the formulas a bit more complex, but you can still do everything and you get for n emitters an electromagnetic continuum. So it's still not too tricky to approve. But still, I mean, we always want more, right? We want simpler models. So now the next question is how can we use this to go to a few mode description, to do few mode field quantization? And before I go into the details here, I want to give some examples of exactly the spectral densities that show up in kind of typical plasmonic or also hybrid systems. Uh, because as we saw exactly the spectral density determines through this function G, which is basically the square root of the spectral density, the coupling of my quantized modes with the emitter. So if I look at the spectral density, for example, in this uh, plasmonic nanogap cavity with two simple spheres, I see a nice peaked structure with quite a few peaks, but I see still clearly identifiable nodes. And if I look at this kind of now they used fancy hybrid plasmonic dielectric cavities where I have a nanoplasmonic system in the center to kind of enhance the field interaction, but they also have a standard mirror or photonic crystal cavity or something like that to get longer lift fields. What I end up getting is uh, hybrid modes and the spectral density in these cases turns, up, turns out being not just kind of nice peaks, but turns out having clear interference effects with kind of a funnel-like shape. So what is plotted here is the normalized local density of states, which is basically the same as the Purcell factor, which is just the spectral density divided through the, by the spectral density in free space, which is just proportional to omega q. So in all of these, this is also Purcell factor, and this is also the Purcell factor. This is essentially the same information as the spectral density itself. And what you see again here is that this is not, that you have this kind of uh, interference effects between different peaks. But still, you see that the spectral densities in these typical systems are really dominated by clear peaks that we know physically correspond to resonances with lifetimes given by the width of the peaks. And the question then is, can I reduce this to a few mode model where I only have a few quantized modes to worry about and I don't have to uh, deal with the whole continuum, which is still quite tricky. So one actually very nice uh, result that has been, that is out from this paper by Stefan Franke, uh, in collaboration with Stephen Hughes and Martin Richter, is to use the so-called quasi-normal modes, which are basically the complex frequency eigenmodes or resonances of the Green's function. And this is possible. They showed that you can do this, but it's quite complex to implement. So we thought being a bit lazier, if we can find a simple approach kind of a simpler way to, to get this without having to go through quasi-normal modes. And the basic idea that we're going to follow is to say we want to replace our continuum of electromagnetic modes described by some spectral density J of omega through a simple system that is actually just a few discrete modes, let's say 
N modes, capital N modes here, and each of them decays and the modes are allowed to interact with each other. So we're gonna say we wanna write down a model Hamiltonian that I split into a system part and the bath part where the system is now a single is the emitter and uh, N discrete electromagnetic modes. And importantly, I'm allowing here interactions between the emitters. So I have off diagonal parts uh, in, in this uh, energy term. And each of the modes is coupled to a simple dipole interaction to the emitter. And then each of the emitters is additionally coupled to a completely flat Markovian background bath. So this is a simple model. And the advantage of doing this simple model is that you can now treat this model Hamiltonian in two very simple ways. One is to do the Markov approximation for this bath, which is to say, uh, I assume that the bath can be integrated out and I treat only the density matrix of the system. And the nice thing is that since we assume this bath to be completely flat, the Markov approximation is, exent is essentially exact. So I get a few more Lindblad master equation that really exactly describes the dynamics of the system Hamiltonian here, which is given by uh, the Lindblad equation of the density matrix uh, propagating with the system Hamiltonian. And then I just have a few uh, standard Lindblad decay terms uh, because of the coupling to the baths. So each of the modes decays independently. But the other thing I can do with this system, and I don't want to go into any of the details here, is this is actually a simple structure of a few discrete modes coupled to a few continua. And that means that I can use all of the machinery of Fano diagonalization that has been developed mostly in the context of atomic physics, of uh, alternizing states in atomic physics. And what this allows me actually to do is to rewrite the model Hamiltonian in a shape, in a form that is exactly the same as this, as the original Hamiltonian. So I can basically diagonalize the discrete modes plus the continua and write them in terms of a single uh, continuum where I get here a spectral density that uh, represents my model G of omega. And the model spectral density is actually given by a very compact, simple expression, which contains the couplings of the discrete modes to the emitter, the inverse of this, uh, of an effective Hamiltonian that is actually a non-Hermitian uh, matrix given by the uh, mode interactions with the mode decay rates on the diagonal. And then again, I have here the interaction with the emitter. So this is actually, I mean, since these are gonna be just a few modes, inverting this Hamiltonian is, tri is trivial and you can just do it numerically. Once it gets bigger for small numbers, you can write it down even analytically. In the archive, in the supplementary, we have it, I think for up to three modes. Uh, we have one and question. Yep. Yeah. Yes, hi, this is Gilad Aran. Uh, you showed this Lindblad um, relaxation uh, operator, and it kind of popped in uh, very quickly. Can you explain again uh, how you get it uh, kind of uh, formally from the uh, previous equations? Yeah, so I have here in, the, in my approximation, or let's say in my model, I assume that I have the system, which are just a few discrete modes, and then I have these baths that are independent baths for each mode. So for each photonic mode, I have one bath that is coupled so this bath is actually a continuum in frequencies, right? So this omega is the frequency of the bath and is coupled linearly to the, emit, uh, to the discrete electromagnetic field, but with a flat prefactor. So with a frequency independent prefactor. So exactly uh, when I then do the standard um, ways to derive a master equation and to get to the Lindblad master equation, what I usually do is that at some point, I assume that my spectral density is flat enough that I can replace the uh, an integral in there by a sim simple value. But for the fact, for exactly the Markovian completely flat bath, this is exact. So I get, and this is just doing a standard uh, derivation of a quantum master equation from a system where I treat one part as the bath and the other as the system. 
but I made sure to write down the coupling in such a way that this approximation or this derivation actually works without any real approximation. And then I end up at the Lindblad master equation. So the relaxation is just parameterized basically here. Yes, so here it's parameterized. So exactly the point is now I have a model uh, spectral density that is parameterized by these numbers. And what I do is I fit them to the numerically calculated spectral density. So this is exactly the next step. What we did up to here is simply write the model easily enough that we get a compact expression for the spectral density corresponding to the model. And now I can use this to fit these parameters, omega ij and kappa i, to actually reproduce the numerically calculated spectral density. I see. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. So exactly as I was saying, we now do this. I mean, now the, the idea is to fit this model spectral density to a numerically calculated spectral density. We chose a system, again, one of these hybrid systems that shows a very uh, kind of structured spectral density that reaches, that kind of has significant contributions over a large frequency range here from 0 0.5 to more than to almost 3 EV, 0.5 and it keeps going. And that again has, because it's this kind of hybrid system, has these interaction effects that you see in this kind of funnel like line shapes in the spectral density itself already. And what we show here is in black the numerical spectral density. So the one obtained from calculating exactly the uh, Green's function, basically. And in yellow, we show the fit of this model to this spectral density. And we see that we can basically achieve a perfect fit uh, with only extremely small deviations here and there. And importantly, the, the crucial ingredient here, here was that we allow interactions in our model. So we allow interactions between the modes, which then allows you to reproduce exactly this kind of interferences. If you use a non-interacting model, so if you use a model where each of the modes, uh, where here this term is just diagonal, it's just independent uh, modes, then the spectral density is essentially a sum of Lorentzians, and you cannot reproduce these interference effects. And for this very complex uh, hybrid micro sphere nanoparticle cavity, the fit here is perfect with 19 modes, or essentially perfect. You could probably add one or two more modes to get these small peaks here as well, but uh, it was not really necessary for, for what we wanted to do then. And just to show that this is not just fitting a function to another function, that uh, if I calculate the dynamics that I get with this uh, simplified model now, uh, we looked at the spontaneous emission dynamics. So basically the wigner weisskopf problem where I start with a single um, excitation in the emitter and then look at the dynamics of the system. Since this is within the single excitation subspace, I can do the exact calculation even with the full continuum. And if I compare this again with the model results, I see that the agreement is perfect, as you would expect from the really good agreement uh, of the spectral density itself. And again, if I look at the non-interacting model, I see that this does not really manage to reproduce the emitter dynamics correctly. Uh, since now I have some discrete modes, I can also look at the populations of these modes and what I see in this specific case where the emitter frequency was chosen here, where you have the dashed red line, is that actually the only two photonic modes that are significantly populated in this model are mode six and seven, which are exactly shown by these dashed gray lines. So I can also get kind of a direct physical insight into the actual modes of the system that play a role, even if I obtain them through fitting. We have another question. Sorry, can you say again, uh, when you say exact, uh, what, what is the calculation? You, you bypass the Lindblad master equation that you construct, right? Like, you, uh, yeah, the exact one is, we just discretize the continuum, since it's a single excitation subspace. This is just discretizing, you use a few hundred or thousand modes if you want, but it's just uh, kind of, it's, in the end, you have to propagate the 1,000 by 1,000 Hamiltonian. 
old, so this can still do it. Or you can, can also alternatively really take the Vigna Weisskopf solution where you can actually write the emitter dynamics as an integration and do it in terms of that. Both work fine. Okay, so it only works for the spontaneous emission problem where you have only a single emitter, a single excitation in the system. Whereas so the emitter situation works for everything. Remind me, so we, the Bittner Weisskopf uh, solution can no, for an arbitrary electromagnetic medium can always be written just purely in terms of the Green's function, right? Which uh, exactly. Um, how do you obtain the and the Green's function? You can obtain it from this J of omega, or, or is is it correct? Yeah, the J. I mean, the other way around. The J of omega is the Green's function. It's the imaginary part of the Green's function from the emitter to the emitter. So that's okay. actually what determines the that's all the information about the photonic structure that the emitter knows. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there's another so, question. Uh, Uh, hello, may I ask a question? Can you hear me, guys? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, so I'm looking at this nice graph, uh, and I'm wondering, uh, have you just guessed the positions of omega i, j, and k, i? Or there was uh, some sort of a system how you picked it up? Because you can do it. uh, it's so, like 19 by 19, it's a, it's a huge amount of parameters, right? Absolutely. 19 square plus chi ij, so it, it's even more than that. Yeah, so omega ij is symmetric, so it's half of 19 squared, but yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, so the way you do, we do it, and I think this is one of the advantages of doing it here with the spectral density, is that we start with a non-interacting model. So we start with uh, a fit where we only have 19 energies and 19 decay rates, mm -hmm. and you can actually, with simple signal kind of, uh, uh, you can basically look for the peaks in the spectral density and the local curvature of the peaks tells you the, the, uh, the loss rates because it tells you the widths. So you start by putting the energies where you have peaks in the spectral density and you in initialize the, the loss rates with the widths of these peaks mm -hmm. and then you fit the non-interacting model. And once you have done that, you use that as the seeding parameters for the full model and it converges quite beautifully. So even this huge amount of parameters yes. still converges, yes. right? Exactly. Okay. So okay. this is one advantage Interesting. of this method. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you kind of have to, you can do it in parts, kind of you fit only a part of the spectral density and then another one. But except in this case, actually, I think we managed to do it all at once. Okay, so now, are there some other questions? Sorry. No, sure. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, can I, can I ask a quick question? Sure. sure. Ah, so uh, sure. is this so? Uh, it's about the non-interacting model. Uh, it, this reminds me of the uh, fitting arbitrary spectral densities to a sum of Lorentzians uh, in the method. This method's. is exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, this, so, is well but, this has been done for a long time. Yeah, so there has been standard procedures for the de for decomposition like this. So is this the best that non-interactive model can do or you're just restricting to say 19 modes? Yeah, you could do 50 modes probably, but to, I mean, to get this interference terms right, you need, would need quite a lot of modes. So we have not tried to see how many modes would actually need here to get all of this right, but it would be certainly significantly more. Okay, thanks. I mean, of course, in any, I mean, you can always fit any function by some of arrangements. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But we still, we want to keep as few modes as possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's one more. Sure. Hi. Hi. Uh, I have a, a related, a, a question related to the pre uh, previous ones. <clears throat> Uh, you commented that uh, uh, this method you developed is uh, uh, like uh, the, uh, it does uh, similar things with this quantized uh, uh, quasi-normal mode uh, theory. And uh, in, uh, in the quasi-normal mode theory, it is uh, like um, uh, very standard to find the 
uh, quasi normal modes in certain frequency range. So for this uh, example, probably you can find, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe nineteen or something uh, discrete quasi normal modes. So do you think it will be uh, helpful for, uh, if you look at the quasi normal modes uh, before you do this uh, fitting? Uh, possibly you could use them. Uh, one thing is that the modes that we get are not exactly the same as the quasi-normal modes in the sense of that if you look at the quantization of the quasi-normal modes, mm -hmm. uh, you see that they have both, they end up being both a non-diagonal Hamiltonian. So they, I mean, the system looks quite similar in the end. They have a Lindbergh master equation with the modes that interact with each other, but they also have non-diagonal terms in the DK. So they have these mixed limper terms where you would have A rho B dagger and B dagger A rho and so on. Yeah, yeah but... Uh, so what you can always do there is diagonalize one of, for example, the loss matrix, and then I think you would probably get exactly the same system as we get. Yeah, but that, I mean... Uh, for the and you input. could, if you have the quasi normal modes, of course, you could also use them as the initial guesses for the fitting. That probably gives you quite good guesses. Yeah, I mean, for the quasi normal modes, they, their quantization for the quasi normal mode theory, uh, they also have, because for the quasi normal modes, they also have an interaction among themselves, right? Yeah. So, uh, I, uh, in my opinion, it uh, looks uh, uh, very similar. Uh, I don't know. If you have uh, uh, given any thought about uh, the connection between these theories, yeah, I think what you get. I mean, you. I'm pretty sure the end result that you get describes the same thing in the sense of you can, if you were to diagonalize or you rewrite, let's say, the quasi-normal mode uh, quantized Hamiltonian in our form, you would see that you get the same parameters, or the other way around, and. In fact, also using Fano theory, let's say we can rewrite the resonance states that are uh, kind of the eigenmodes of this complex Hamiltonian. We could express them explicitly as superpositions of the original uh, modes B omega. So there are formulas for this. And I'm guessing that they would look very similar to the quasi normal modes. We have not tried that. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. So, yes, as I was saying, uh, now since we can calculate the emitter dynamics and we also know uh, all the electromagnetic modes that show up in the system, uh, we can now also calculate the electromagnetic field distribution, for example, everywhere in space. So this would be the formula uh, when you work it out, you can show that you can simply calculate it through the autocorrelation function of the dipole uh, with itself. So the dipole-dipole autocorrelation function of the emitter and multiply it by basically the temporal Green's function. So the Fourier transform of the normal Green's function, or let's say it's imaginary part. And that allows you to, to calculate the electromagnetic field in the system as it is being emitted from the emitter. So I'm going to show a quick video here which shows this. So you see that the emitter here in the center between the plasmonic nanoparticles started emitting. And maybe I'm going to go back here. You see that in the beginning, very quickly the field propagates around this microsphere and then at some point kind of stabilizes in the two modes that are mostly populated, number six and seven of the sphere while the emitter is mostly emitted. And you see this uh, nice, quite complex electromagnetic field distribution showing up. I want to point out here, since this is a spontaneous emission, there's actually no coherent field. So this is not a field, this is not just a classical electromagnetic field calculation with a classical dipole driving it. This is really kind of a quantum calculation in some sense. Okay. So, this uh, finishes this part about the field mode field quantization. And just to summarize, what we get in the end is a 
a quite simple self-contained framework to do a few mode quantization of really quite arbitrary nanophotonic structures. And really the only thing you need is to be able to calculate the Green's functions, which allows you to get the spectral densities and also the electric fields everywhere in the system. So you can use any of the available standard electromagnetic field solvers to calculate the Green's function and then get a, a few mode quantum model out of this. Okay, so now I'm getting to the second part, although I'm seeing that the time is really running out already. So I try to be very fast. Uh, how can we now use this for ultra-fast polaritonic chemistry? So now we want to start focusing on the emitters. And up to now, we kind of thought about two-level systems. But of course, we know that two-level system is not a molecule. A molecule has very complex structure. It has uh, nuclear motion. It has a huge amount of nuclear degrees of freedom, in fact. It usually has large exciton phonon coupling, meaning that if I excite it, I really induce a lot of nuclear motion, which is typically quite fast, and it can undergo reactions. So it can really change its, uh, its uh, behavior or its structure quite strongly. So can we use strong coupling to these uh, very lossy modes in plasmonic cavities to learn more about the molecules or even control them? And, and just to think about time scales, uh, the, there's this very nice paper from the group of Jeremy Baumberg, where they did exactly short pulse driving of a single molecule embedded in one of these nano gap uh, cavities, yeah, where the molecule is actually fixed in space with the DNA orogamy. And what they have there is really everything basically happening on uh, ultra short femtosecond time scales. You have short pulse driving on femtosecond scales. You have an excitation lifetime of the plasmons of femtoseconds. You have Rabi oscillations that are on the order of femtoseconds. And you have fast nuclear dynamics that themselves happen on the order of femtoseconds. So you really get ultra fast electronic, photonic, and phononic dynamics. And this is, in some sense, both the internal dynamics of the emitters and the external dynamics in terms of absorption and emission. And one thing that we ask ourselves is, can we use the fast spontaneous emission you get there to actually learn something about the molecule? So the theory part, I think I'm gonna skip because I'm guessing everyone knows this, the idea of I can use the polaritonic, the potential energy surfaces of the molecules in the same kind of picture as I had before, where I have then a surface of the, of the bare molecule and the photon excited surface that is just shifted up by the photon energy. And if I diagonalize here the, the emitter uh, field interaction, I get this new polaritonic potential energy surfaces that are called, again, can be called the upper polariton and lower polariton surface. And in some sense, that tells me that with polaritonic potential energy surfaces or with polaritonic chemistry, I want to uh, guide the way. I don't want to change. I, I don't want to guide the way. I want to change the roads. I want to change the potential energy surfaces that the dynamics take place on. So the model we're going to treat is a very simple molecule, a single anthracene molecule in one of these plasmonic nanogap cavities. And we're going to pump it with a few femtosecond laser pulse. So the potential energy surfaces you get there, here I'm just showing the excited state uh, subspace for single excitation. So I can either excite my molecule, which gives me an exit on the molecule, that's the blue surface, or I can put a photon or more precisely a plasmon into the cavity, which gives me a copy of the ground state surface of the molecule shifted up by the photon energy. And exactly because of the light matter interaction, I get here the splitting into the upper polariton and the lower polariton surface. And very importantly, uh, the character of my surface is now position dependent. So here on the right, this is indicated by the color scale. On the right, the lower polariton is more uh, exciton-like, so it's really an excitation on the molecule, and the upper polariton is photon-like, and vice versa on the left. The upper, the upper polariton is exciton-like, and the lower polariton is photon-like or plasmon-like. So that means that really uh, I have the fast, the ultra-fast plasmonic decay only if I'm on the, if I'm, let's say, in the lower polariton, only if I'm on the left part of my potential energy surface. So if my nuclear wave packet is here at negative nuclear positions. I've just chosen conveniently the zero exactly where the two surfaces intersect. 
So if now I come in with an ultra short pump pulse and I launch a nuclear wave packet that's going to start oscillating in here, anytime the nuclear wave packet reaches the left part of the surface, it's going to go into this plasmonic dominated part of the potential energy surface and it's going to emit uh, photons preferentially. So if I look at the time resolved emission out of my cavity, this is this blue line here, I can see that this really uh, tracks exactly the nuclear wave packet motion that I'm also plotting here as a function of time. So the y-axis here is the nuclear position as a function of time after absorption of the, of the laser pulse. So I have a very short laser pulse that drives this. And then the nuclear wave packet starts absorbing, it uh, starts oscillating, and at the same time emitting photons whenever it is down here. So the time resolved photon emission here can be seen to really be, uh, to really follow this uh, orange line where I've just integrated the probability of the wave packet to be at negative nuclear positions. So I can really probe when the wave packet passes my photon-like region. So what I'm getting in some sense is really all optical probing of the coherent wave packet motion without having to use any probe pulses. So typically if I wanna learn about wave packet motion, I would have to do pump probe setups. And here I just send in a single shot pulse and then I have to measure the time resolved emission, which certainly isn't easy, but I don't need to synchronize a second pulse uh, and I don't need to understand all of the processes that that probe pulse does on the, on the molecule. Since time is really a bit short, I'm gonna skip here a few parts. Uh, here I just wanna mention that the first, uh, when I talked about this, I really talked about a single nuclear degree of freedom. We know, as we just discussed, that the molecule really has a huge amount of nuclear degrees of freedom. For example, you can again express this through a spectral density that gives you the vibrational spectrum of the molecule. And if you wanna treat this correctly, you have the problem that the Hilbert space that you need scales exponentially with the number of modes. So if I wanna treat here a continuum of nuclear modes, let's say at least all of these peaks, I get extremely unfavorable scaling of my Hilbert space and the brute force approach is basically impossible. So the solution we're using here is the so-called uh, uh, tensor network approach, which is based on first doing uh, mathematical transformation of the Hamiltonian. Again, I'm not gonna go into any details that basically transform, transforms my problem into a quasi one dimensional Hamiltonian where I have only nearest neighbor interactions between the vibrational modes and only one vibrational mode, the first one in the chain is actually coupled to the, to the emitter or to the exciton. And then this is exactly the kind of structure where tensor networks are extremely powerful because they use the, the, the wave function in such a 1D system does not actually explore the full Hilbert space, but only a low entanglement subspace. So again, I don't go into any details, but I can, replay, I can represent here wave function as a product of many relatively small matrices, but tensors instead of one huge tensor with uh, a huge amount of degrees of freedom. So this approach actually allows a full quantum simulation of quite a lot of molecules, 16 molecules is the most we have done with each one 350 vibrational degrees of freedom on a single node with not too much memory. So this is really a quite powerful uh, numerical approach. The method we use is really the one developed by Florian Schroeder and Alex Chin. So the details are in that paper. And when we do this now for this molecule in the polaritonic clock to check that our simple model is not too optimistic, what we see is if we look, for example, at the green line, the solid green line is what we get with the single mode and the dashed green line is what we get taking into account all of the vibrational modes, so this tensor network approach. And we see that really, uh, I still get this nice oscillation in the time resolved emission, which is what I'm plotting here of the, of the molecule. But of course, by introducing all of these extra vibrational modes, I introduce vibrational rephasing and so the oscillation disappears after a few cycles. And here I start seeing that I cannot see it nicely. So exactly here, it's crucial that I'm using a plus one that gives me ultra fast emission so that I can measure this, or I could potentially measure 
this ultra fast emission within just a few tens of femtoseconds before vibrational dephasing destroys the whole signal. And uh, just as a nice comment here, if I don't use harmonic oscillators actually for the potential energy surfaces, but I take into account that in reality, molecules are more complex. For example, I use a MOS potential. I see that I can actually, by pumping at different frequencies, so by tuning my probe pump laser to different frequencies, I can actually directly map the classical oscillation period of the wave packet in this MOS potential to the time-dependent emission of my observed from my plasmonic nanocavity. So I can really get very direct insight into this uh, wave packet motion. Okay, uh, here, I'm gonna skip this also. We just show that it also works if you use more than one molecule. And I'm gonna, I don't know, should I go to the next part or should I stop? I don't know what's I, I think it's a good time to stop. I mean, we have a, right now one, well, two questions. Um, so I guess, I guess just because of the interest of time, yeah. You can stop here or just give a, your final summary. Yeah, I'll just uh, go over this very, I'll just give the basic ideas because these are actually very short parts anyway. So basically what we showed here is that uh, you can use a plasmonic nanocavity now, again, in the idea of using the losses to get quite efficient uh, radio protection or photo protection for uracil, which is this uh, RNA base that uh, when it's excited by UV light can get photo damage. The, the kind of tricky part here was that you need to actually treat uh, at least two dimensional wave packet motion on a very much not harmonic oscillator surface. So we uh, actually had to do kind of more complex wave packet dynamics in this case. And just to very quickly give the final result, basically we can uh, improve with a realistic uh, plasmonic silver nanosphere, so very simple, the simplest nanocavity you can think of, uh, the photo protection by a factor of about around 1.5. So we can uh, make the, the molecule decay significantly faster than in free space and therefore reduce the risk of photo damage. And in the last, this one I really won't go into detail. Basically what we showed there is a comparison systematically between different approximations to all of this complexity you have when you have a complex photonic spectral density or plasmonic spectral density and a complex molecular spectral density. So we basically show that the standard approximations of a two-level system or a single vibrational mode are only okay for a few femtoseconds and uh, you can do kind of Fermi's golden rule for doing long-term trends, but if you really want to understand this kind of system, you kind of have to do the real work. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna go to my summary and conclusions, and thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, so we have two questions, let me... Hey. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Johannes, this is Frank Hohen from Rochester. Really, really nice talk. Thank you, thank you so much. So I have two questions. Uh, the first one is related to your, your emission probe, right? You're trying to probe the nuclear dynamics through uh, you know, emission of a photon. But my question yeah. is, because your vape pack is actually on a, on a uh, platonic surface, right? You're only probing part of the electronic excitation. You're not having a full probe of electronic surfaces, right? Because you're, you're moving on a, on a hybrid surface. So I was wondering, do you have additional strategies that allows you to have a complete probe of electronic excitation instead of just part of that? So basically, R bigger than zero, that's, that's the part you, you're, you're having pure electronic excitation, right? Yeah, I mean, you could tune the cavity to be on resonance at a different uh, frequency, but what I wanted to men mention is, uh, I mean, on the one hand, what we were interested in here is actually probing the the potential, uh, the polaritonic potential energy surfaces, so the ones that are modified through the strong coupling, which is if you reach the strong coupling limit. But if you don't reach the strong coupling limit, 
you can actually probe still through this method uh, the bare molecule potential energy surfaces. So basically you just use that your plasmonic cavities, if your coupling strength is not quite strong enough to reach strong coupling, you still get extremely fast per cell enhancement. So you get emission in a few femtoseconds and this actually works better if you have a very lossy cavity than if you have a not too lossy cavity. And you, in that case, you can actually probe the bare uh, potential energy surface of the molecule. And I by changing the detuning, or let's say the energy of your photon mode, you can kind of change which position of the potential energy surface you're probing. I see. So basically you're using the non-adiabatic effects, right, among platonic surfaces. The wave packs will, will make transition when the coupling is really weak, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's just, it basically becomes here a, time, a position dependent decay rate. So I if you see. want your exciton surface, the real part doesn't really change, but the imaginary part changes. I see. This is, I think, the easiest way to think about it. Yeah. My second question is related to your, your general Hamiltonian. So where, where you write down yeah. the, the T dot A and the D dot E Hamiltonian. Can you go back to that? Okay. Yeah. It's a, a very beginning. So I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit confused why in a, in a P dot A Hamiltonian, you can partially replace some term by D dot E. I'm not replacing anything. This comes out directly by doing macroscopic uh, electrodynamics. So in, if you're close to material structure, you have longitudinal fields, basically because you have charges moving there. I see. So Q, Q, Q alpha phi, right? So that you are replacing that charge field interaction with a, with a emitter dipole. Yeah. So if I don't do, exactly, if I don't do the dipole approximation, this term is actually just, you have an electrostatic potential that comes from the charges in the metal that is always there. And that actually is the dominant contribution to the interaction if you are in a sub wavelength cavity. I see. I agree well, with you. That, uh, I see. I see. Thanks. But I agree with you that D dot E term it, itself it's, it's gauge independent because there is no gauge dependent quantities. On the other hand, you still have P dot A and A square. So if you sum up these three terms together, I bet it is no longer gauge invariance. So the whole Hamiltonian. No, is of course. This is, I mean, here this is what here this is the longitudinal one. So what basically happens if I do this gauge transformation to, which is the same as the power in our Woolley transformation, is that this P dot A and A squared give me a term that is D dot E transversal, and then I write this just at D dot E. But the term that is D dot E transversal is not affected by the power in our Woolley transformation, because that only affects the transversal fields, the transverse fields. No, because, so because what the gauge transformation, the typical gauge transformation from, or if you want to call it Coulomb gauge and dipole gauge, affects only the P dot A and the A squared, which is what I usually have when I'm not close to a, to a material body. But in a realistic sub wavelength cavity, actually, this is the term that I have from the beginning, and the, there's no gauge dependence. So, so you must have like a P square term somewhere hidden in your... No, that's the point. This is the, oh. the P square term only comes from the transverse fields. The longitudinal interaction doesn't have a P square term. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the uh, uh, momentum operator, P square. So it's in... Ah, in sure, the, the P square is here in the... In the then then it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. So here I, I did this typical script. I mean, I could write this as P minus A squared. But I did the typical split of writing the bi emitter Hamiltonian as P squared, and here I have the two terms that are P dot A and A squared. I see. You just make a choice that you, you no longer write down the, uh, um, the mirror field purely as A, but you choose to separate it out. As I cannot choose it. This is not a choice. I have no way around this. I have no way of not getting a longitudinal field if I want my modes to actually solve the direct the Maxwell equations for the macroscopic Maxwell equations. But if you're choosing Coulomb gauge, then this E longitudinal is purely captured through the electrostatic interaction. It will be like, you know, the Q. Yes, no, this is always the mirror and the emitter. This is exactly, this is just the electrostatic interaction with the charges in the metal. But this is not a Coulomb, this is not a gauge dependent choice. 
this term is always the same. This is not affected, let's say at least it's not affected by the gauge transformation from Coulomb to dipole gauge. It might look different in, uh, in another gauge, let's say in Lorentz gauge, I don't know how it exactly looks like. But here I'm just talking about the Coulomb and the, and the dipole gauge that I typically use, or the multipolar form and the minimal coupling form if you want. So this is minimal coupling in Coulomb gauge, but taking into account that I have a material body there. And then I have no way around it. Thanks, maybe we can talk later. Sure. Yeah, so uh, there are many uh, raising hands. So I'm just going to let one more person to ask a question. I encourage the other four people to type their questions in the Q&A panel and maybe we can forward them to the speaker and you can look for the answers in the YouTube comment section of the video. Uh, okay. So, okay. Hi, Johannes. Sorry, uh, Jorge. Maybe uh, since I already asked several questions, why don't you just uh, leave all, get, let other people answer, and I will send them. All, all, all of a sudden, everyone uh, stop uh, raising their hand. Okay, so then let me ask a very quick question. So, sorry, Johannes. So uh, this very clear and pedagogical talk. I want to ask you a very naive question. Uh, when you, I mean, when you have this plasmonic media, you have modes that radiate into the far field and those that don't. Uh, how does uh, how how do you when you calculate these Purcell uh, these Purcell factors uh, different frequencies? How do you agnostically address this issue from a computational standpoint? Yes, I mean, I guess this goes back to kind of classical electromagnetism, what you can do is for one, calculate the, the spectral density that gives you the sum of everything. So non-radiative and radiative contributions. Yes. And then what is typically done is that you put your system in a box and you uh, integrate the flux that goes out at each frequency and that gives you the radiative contribution. And then you know the rest is non-radiative. Okay, so and is that uh, also in the classical calculation already check where is this energy absorbed if you are interested in it? Let's see. So, uh, just for this particular example you showed uh, in your talk, uh, is that um, do you explain all these parts? I would like to see the details of that. Is that in your papers? Uh, in the last uh, paper, this one, the plasmonic Purcell effect, we actually split the radiative and the non radiative uh, modes. So I you do that, you, you, you put that in a box? And how we calculate it, but it's kind of the standard approach. I mean, I can look up the references where people discuss it. Then I can ask Antonio who did the, the classical EM calculations there, how he actually did it in this case. But as far as I remember, it's this, yeah. It's a box okay. and you look at how much it makes. Thank you. Uh, all right, so uh, thank you. Johannes, this was a very interesting and illuminating talk. Uh, so can you please let me share? Uh, yeah. All right, so uh, I want to thank all of you who, rem sorry, this must not be one, but yeah. Uh, I would like to uh, thank everyone who stopped by uh, today we had a turnout of 94 participants, so I think that was a, a very good uh, number of attendees. And uh, please tune in next week for David Litzi from the University of Sheffield. Um, well, so thank you again, Johannes. Thank you all who were here and see you next week.